Hi everyone, in this video we are going to find an expression for the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor and the approach we're going to take is to consider each of the plates as an essentially infinite sheet of charge, use Gauss's law to find the electric field due to an infinite sheet of charge, then use the principle of superposition to add the fields due to each plate together, get the overall field and hence find the capacitance. So let's start off by just annotating this simple diagram of a parallel plate capacitor with some of the key parameters that we expect our result to depend on. I think the most intuitive thing that we expect our result to depend on is the size of the plates because capacitance is defined as charge per unit of voltage and if you have bigger plates then you would expect to be able to store more charge on those plates for a given amount of uh, potential difference or given amount of voltage. And so we're going to uh, quantify that by saying each plate has an area of A, we're going to assume that they have the same size and shape, and each of them has an area of A. I've also just labelled the perpendicular distance between the plates as D, and it seems reasonable that we might expect the capacitance to depend on D, um, because for example if we take the plates towards infinite separation, you just pull them apart, they're going to be interacting less and less the further apart they get. And so you might intuitively think that the capacitance is going to decrease as we increase that separation, which does turn out to be true, as we'll see at the end. Now, as it turns out, A and D are the only two parameters that we need to determine the capacitance of this capacitor, to a pretty good approximation at least, but it's going to be helpful to label one more thing on our diagram, which is the charge stored on each of the plates. So let's say there is a charge of Q on the lower plate. Q is going to be positive, so I'm just going to write that as plus Q just to emphasize that. Now remember the way that a capacitor actually builds up its charge is that electrons um, are pushed onto one plate, um, and therefore because of the electrostatic force, the electrostatic repulsion of those electrons, the electrons on the opposite plate are going to be pushed away. And so if you build up a charge of plus Q on one plate, um, you have you must have built up a charge of minus Q on the other plate, because each electron will push one electron um, off the opposite side. So the plates have equal and opposite charges, so we would have labeled that one as minus Q. So I've just added over on the right hand side a more three-dimensional diagram of one of the plates. So let's say this is the plate that's been charged with a charge of um, plus Q. Now simply because it's charged it's going to be producing its own electric field. Um, what can we say about the direction of that electric field? Well uh, remember that the surface of a conductor in electrostatics is an equipotential, um, meaning the potential electric potential is a constant everywhere on the surface. If that was not the case then there would be a potential difference within the surface of the conductor and electrons would just move around until that potential difference no longer existed, right? So assuming that we've reached a steady state distribution of, of charge, the surface of a conductor is an equipotential, and because the electric field is the gradient or minus the gradient um, of the electric potential, the field must be normal to the surface of the conductor. So we can start drawing on some electric field lines. Uh, note that they have to be pointing away from the conductor itself rather than towards because the direction of an electric field line um, you can think of the direction as telling you the direction that a positive charge would feel a force in and because our plate is positive it would be pushing away um, other other nearby positive charges so I'm just going to label those field lines as E um, and it's going to have to be you know it, it would be exerting a force downwards on any uh, positive charges which were which were below the plate. So you've got field lines pointing in both ways. Uh, let me just make that a little bit more symmetrical um, by shifting over on my, my field lines like that. So that's what the electric field looks like. We're also sort of implicitly making use of the assumption that the, uh, the sheet is infinite in size um, by drawing these arrows evenly spaced and therefore um, saying that our electric field is uniform. Right? If the sheet is infinitely big then by symmetry, the fields should not be varying depending on where you are within that plate or above that plate, right? Because if you've got wherever you are above the plate, you have an infinite amount of uh, charged sheet below or above you. And so uh, we just use that symmetry argument to say that the electric field should be uniform. In reality, of course, that's not quite correct. And the field lines would start to bend as you approach the edge of your charged sheet, but if it's infinite then it doesn't have an edge in the first place, and so uh, that allows us to simplify our calculations quite a lot. So how can we actually work out the size of that electric field E? Well we can use Gauss's law. Uh, let me just quote Gauss's law here. It says that the surface integral 
of the electric field um, over some closed surface is equal to the amount of charge enclosed by that surface divided by the uh, constant epsilon zero. Now we're free to choose any surface we like um, to integrate over, but we should always choose the one that uh, sort of makes the integral uh, as easy to do as possible. And here, by symmetry, the best choice of integration surface would be some sort of prism. So let me draw on what I mean there. Let's draw, let's make it a cylinder. It could really be any shape of, uh, of prism, but let's say it's a cylinder. So I've got the top of the cylinder there. Um, let's say it goes all the way down, uh, sort of equal distances on both sides of our uh, charge sheet. Let me just move that down a bit. And then we've got our lower uh, face of the, um, the cylinder down there. So that's going to be our integration surface. We'll evaluate the surface integral of the electric field over that cylindrical surface. The reason why this is a sensible Gaussian surface to integrate over in this case is that um, a large contribution to that surface integral just becomes zero. Specifically, the contribution to the integral um, over the curved surface of the cylinder, right? In other words, this, this big surface here that wraps all the way around, because along that surface, the electric field is parallel to um, the surface itself. Uh, remember that your ds in your surface integral is a uh, vector that points outwards and normal to your surface, right? So on this curved surface, your little ds vector would be pointing outwards like this. So there's your ds vector. And so ds dot e along the curved surface is just zero. So that means we only have to worry about the contributions to the surface integral uh, on the top and bottom faces. And again, by symmetry, the top and bottom faces have to give the same contribution. So it really reduces just to doing the integral um, over one of those faces. Now, if we say the surface area of the circular face of our cylinder is, let's say, lowercase a, because you already used capital A earlier, um, then using the fact that we argued that the electric field is uniform, the, uh, the, the surface integral is actually particularly easy because you can just multiply the electric field by the surface area. So you get A times E, and then we just multiply that by two because we get by symmetry the same contribution from the, uh, the face at the bottom. So that's your surface integral. It's just two AE where A is the uh, surface area of the top bit of your cylinder. Notice it doesn't matter whether it's a cylinder or some other kind of prism. Um, all, all it depends on is the surface area of the, the end faces um, of that prism. Now, what about the right-hand side of our statement of Gauss's law? Well, it should be the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. So let's just keep our one over epsilon naught um, factor. Uh, in terms of, well, how to write an expression for the enclosed charge, um, remember that the total charge on our charge plate was Q, but then the amount of charge which is enclosed within that cylinder will be in proportion to the, uh, the amount of the plate which is covered by that cylinder, right? So what I mean by that is your, your cylinder is covering a fraction of the plate of small a over big A, right? And therefore the charge enclosed within that cylinder should be Q times that same proportion because the charge is just assuming it's a uniform distribution of charge, charge is just proportional um, to the, the area. Now, if you are particularly alert as you're watching this video, you might feel a little bit concerned about having a Q and an A there when I've said that it's an infinite plate and therefore Q and A should both really be infinite. But the important thing is Q over A is actually finite because that's just the charge density charge per unit area. So having applied Gauss's law, we can just rearrange this. Conveniently, the small A's cancel from both sides. So it doesn't matter how big the Gaussian surface that we chose um, is. Um, we deduce that the electric field is the total charge um, divided by 2 epsilon naught um, times a, or to look at it another way, it's the charge density divided by 2 epsilon naught. But now that we've got an expression for the electric field of an infinite sheet of charge, we can do some superposition to figure out the electric field um, inside the capacitor. So inside our capacitor, we would still expect, because we're adding together two uniform fields, one from each um, plate, we'd still expect a uniform field um, inside. I'm just going to write down, we're going to consider the case inside the capacitor, in other words, in between the two plates to start with. Well, your total electric field, you're going to get Q over 2 epsilon naught A from the positive plate at the bottom. You are going to get the same contribution from the plate at the top, right? Because the magnitude of the electric field should be the same. 
um, but the field lines would be pointing in the same direction as the field from the positive charge, right? The, the positive charge is pushing away from itself, in other words, upwards, and the field lines from the negative plate are pulling upwards, it's pulling positive charge towards um, itself. So all that happens when you do the principle of superposition is that you get two times uh, the electric field due to one plate and the two on the denominator disappears. So your internal electric field inside the capacitor is just uh, Q divided by epsilon naught A. What about outside the capacitor, in other words, not between the plates, but sort of uh, above the negative plate or below the positive plate? So if you consider, for example, this red circled piece of space um, down there, the field from the positive plate is going to be pushing downwards at that point, right? Because the positive plate will always be pushing positive charges away from itself. The field from the negative plate will still be pulling upwards, right? The negative plate is pulling charge towards itself. Now, those two electric field vectors that I've drawn there, one from each plate, they have the same magnitude because, well, as we saw in this expression that we got for the infinite um, sheet of charge, the electric field doesn't depend on how far away you are from the plate, right? And so you've got two equal and opposite electric field vectors adding together there. So you actually have zero electric field um, outside your capacitor. Again, remember, this is a bit of an approximation. The plates are not actually infinite. So you'll, you will end up getting a small electric field outside the plates. Um, however, certainly much smaller than it is um, inside. So I've just made a note of that. Zero electric field outside the capacitor there. But how does all of this relate to capacitance? That was our ultimate goal, remember? Well, we've got the electric field. Um, the capacitance is defined as charge stored per unit voltage, but voltage is very closely related to um, electric field, right? Voltage is just the difference in electric potential between two points. And your electric field vector in vector form is minus the gradient um, of your, your uh, potential, which I'm going to call uh, V there. So because E is minus the gradient of V, um, you can do a line integral on both sides of that vector equation there and find that the difference in potential, which is a scalar, between two points is minus the line integral of E dot DL, where DL is your little uh, line element. And that will work between, well, if you, if you do integral between two fixed points, you can take any uh, integration path between those two points because in electrostatics, electric fields are conservative. Now for the definition of capacitance, we don't really care about the polarity of the voltage. In other words, um, whether it's positive or negative, that just depends on um, which way around we take our two integration endpoints. So I'm just gonna uh, make our lives a bit simpler by taking the modulus of our delta V and just getting rid of that minus sign uh, there. Uh, then we'll think about how to do this integral and this is pretty easy because you can just choose your integration path to be from some point on uh, your positive plate to a point directly above that on your negative plate, right? And you just do your line integral along a straight line, which is perpendicular uh, to both plates. So our integral becomes, well, the integrand itself is just this Q over epsilon naught A. So let's put that in there, Q over epsilon naught A. Um, times your line element DL. At the starting point, you've traveled zero distance from the, the starting point, so I put zero there. Um, by the time you've got to the, uh, the end point of your integral, you've gone a distance of D in a straight line, so I can just put my upper limit of the integral as D, and that's a very easy integral because you're integrating a constant, right? And so you just get Q over epsilon A multiplied by D, uh, or Q D um, over epsilon naught A. And so then we just plug that into the definition of capacitance. So capacitance is the charge stored um, per unit applied voltage. So because the delta V is on the bottom, you flip your fraction upside down and you also get rid of this Q because there's a Q in the definition of capacitance. So you get epsilon naught um, A over D. So the last thing I want to mention in this video um, relates to this expression, this Q over epsilon naught A that we found for the field, the electric field inside the capacitor. Right, so as I've alluded to a couple of times throughout the video, um, the field lines bend outwards as you go towards the edges of your capacitor um, because the assumption that you have infinitely big plates completely breaks down there. And so that electric field expression only really applies um, towards the center of the capacitor. It's going to be a pretty good approximation until you get very close to the edges. Um, but in my next video, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about these 
uh, so-called edge effects in the capacitor. And I'll be showing you what I think is quite a cool trick that you can use to actually quantify the strength of the electric field at the edge of a capacitor compared with the strength um, towards the center of the capacitor. So thank you for watching and see you soon.